Hey, welcome back. Today we will be discussing about this interesting circuit which tries to emulate a common mathematical function. Before proceeding with the video, I recommend you to try analyzing it on your own. To make things simpler and to establish a methodology to analyze circuits, you may begin by considering the simplest of cases or the extreme cases. In this case, that would be i1 equal to i2, i1 much much greater than i2 and i1 much much smaller than i2. By the way, I am now on top mate and you guys can connect with me there as well. With that out of the way, let's get started with the video. I'll try to show how I analyzed the circuit when I first saw it. Upon seeing the circuit, two things came to my mind, current mirror and cascode. Whenever I see a complex circuit which is new to me, I try to break it down into smaller chunks of circuits which I'm already familiar with. So then I looked at the case when I1 is much much greater than I2 with an assumption that all the transistors are in saturation. If we see any contradiction, then we can modify that assumption. So if I1 is sufficiently large, then the VGS of M1 would be sufficiently large to bias M2 in saturation. Moreover, if the gate voltage of M2 is sufficiently large, then so will its source voltage be. And thus M3 can be in saturation as well. This is indeed a way to generate a cascode bias voltage where M2 is the cascode bias device and M3 is the main current source carrying a current of I2. As a homework, you can even figure out how much I1 should be larger than I2 for both the transistors to be in saturation. I'll give you some options. I1 equal to 2I2, I1 equal to 4I2 and I1 equal to 10I2. For this, you can assume that the body effect is negligible and all the transistors are matched. So the next case is what happens if I2 is much much greater than I1. In that case, M4 and M3 would have a large gate voltage and thus the VDSAT of M3 would be large. Also since I1 is small, the gate voltage and thus the source voltage of M2 would be small, pushing M3 into linear region. That means now M3 acts as a resistor. So you can reduce the circuit into something like this. This is still a current mirror, but it has an iner inherent error due to the asymmetrical source degeneration. The source of M1 is grounded, whereas the source of M2 would have a small voltage of about 15 millivolts, depending upon the R on of M3. So the current I out is approximately I1. Until now, we saw that if I1 is much much greater than I2, then you have I out as I2. And if I2 is much much greater than I1, then I out is about I1. So it might be tempting to say that I out gives the minimum of I1 and I2. The final case I1 equals to I2 bursts that bubble. If I1 equals to I2 equals to let's say I, then the gate voltage of M1 and M4 are equal. The circuit essentially reduces to a stacked composite transistor with an effective length of 2L. If you didn't get this, I'd recommend that you watch my other video on stacking of transistors. That should make things clearer. Since M2 and M3 form a transistor with an effective aspect ratio of W over 2L, we can say that I out is about I by 2, which is not what a minimum current function should have resulted in. By the way, if you find my videos valuable, please smash that like button and don't shy away from subscribing. Let me just conclude this video by plotting what you would see if you simulate this interesting circuit. So in my test bench, I fixed I2 and, I, and then I swept I1 from a value much smaller than I2 to a value much larger than I2. The resulting plot for I out looked something like this. It verified our analysis for the extreme cases and we see that there is a smooth transition in the middle. Now the question is, 
where do you think this type of circuit can be utilized? I'll let you think over that. Well, that's it for this video and see you in the next one. Happy learning.